Good evening, everyone. The time is 7.02. This meeting is in session, and it is being recorded. Councilwoman Jones, could you do the invocation, please? Certainly. Our eternal God, our Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you how you've provided for us, how you've protected us, how you've watched over us and made provision in every way that we've needed, oh God. We thank you for this meeting, Father. We ask, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would get the glory and the honor Do your name. We pray, Father, for the leadership of this city. We pray for the citizens of this city. We pray for the legislators, the administration, and all of the workers, Father, that make this city what it is. We thank you, Father, for the invited guests on tonight, that they would bring a presentation, God, that would bring uh, clarification and what we need to hear concerning this new project that's coming to our area. We thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercies. We ask you to remember all of the sick among us. Remember all of those that are homeless, God. Remember those that are hungry. We thank you for your loving kindness. It is in Jesus' name that I pray. And we all say amen. Amen. Thank you, Councilwoman. You're welcome. Jones. Um, Council Clerk, could you do the roll call, please? Hmm. Councilwoman Fareed. Here. Councilwoman Guillaume. Here. Councilwoman Harrison. Here. Okay. <laughs> Councilwoman, I'm sorry, Councilman Herring. Here. Councilwoman Jones. Here. Council Vice President Ferguson. Here. And Council President will be joining us momentarily. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So move. Second. There's a second. Second. Thank you. Council Clark. Oh, oh. Rick, we have a we're having a humming. Uh, voting on the motion to approve the agenda. Councilwoman Fareed. Councilwoman Guillaume. Yes. Councilman Harrison. Yes. Councilman Herring. Yes. yes. Councilwoman Joe. Yes. Council Vice President Ferguson. Yes. And then we have a presentation on the data center. Thank you. There you go. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Council, uh, for, for having us this evening to give you guys a briefing on uh, the data center uh, that is proposed for Landover Mall. I just want to clarify a few things. We did provide uh, copies, hand copies of both presentations that we have. One is specifically about the data center use in general, and one is about the uh, transportation analysis that was performed as part of the preliminary plan. Uh, you have a hard copy. I know that we provided a digital copy of the PowerPoint. Uh, just want to make sure that if, if it's going to come up on the screen, we have an opportunity to, to put it up there. Um, while, while that's going up, I think it, it, it makes a lot of sense just to share where we are in the process. Right now, we are, uh, the preliminary plan of subdivision has been accepted, and the planning board for this matter is expected on March 14th. We would expect that the, that the staff report for this matter, the county staff report, is going to be available uh, around March 1st. Uh, and and we welcome anybody and everybody to show up to the hearing that might want to participate in the process. Uh, Excuse me, Mr. Hatcher. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you speak up into the mic? They can't hear in the back. Thank you. Uh, can can they hear me now? And while the presentation is still coming up, uh, wanted to share with you guys that. 
in case you, for anybody who may not be aware, the preliminary plan of subdivision is when adequacy of public facilities is tested in the county. So your police response times, your fire, your transportation network, um, in certain instances, uh, library adequacy, things like that is typically tested at preliminary plan. And so although we have a presentation for you regarding the data centers and its transportation impact, uh, the, the preliminary plan isn't really focused on the use, but we know that there is a lot of interest in the use, so we wanted to share the information. He, he, uh, uh, Mr. Guckard West, our transportation engineer, is on, and he has a one of the presentations, the one entitled Bright Seat Tech Park Data Center Traffic Impact. Uh, I was going to go through the Bright Seat Tech Park, Prince George's County, dated 2924. And it's okay if it doesn't come up. I can just go through it here. That's fine with everyone else. Okay. I uh, wanted to leave you all uh, start and end and sporadically in between just sort of go through what we view as the the benefits for the proposed development the first one being uh, adequacy of public facilities um, what we are proposing the data centers on this property will generate less than one-tenth of what would otherwise be envisioned in the master plan approved in the MXT zone or the TAC zone which it is zoned right now that's one tenth of the traffic uh, and produce no school aged children because it's not residential. Uh, another one of the major benefits that Mr. Guckel will go through uh, during his pre presentation is the roughly one point, approximately $1.8, $1.9 million in pedestrian and bicycle improvements that will occur uh, as this development comes online. And, and the final one, uh, which is particularly um, particularly, I, it's sort of a softer spot in my mind growing up right down the street is, uh, you know, it, it will look significantly better than it does now, and it has for the last 20 years, um, with five new office buildings, essentially. Uh, and if you take a look at the presentation as I'm going through, you'll see examples of what they look like throughout the region. Can I just interrupt for a moment? Yes, um, Mr. Hatcher, I'm, I'm hoping um, that we could just kind of take a step back for a moment and yes, provide some context for the citizens, since this is a public hearing, mm -hmm. um, on what a data center is, like what what is the purpose of this, right. this space? So uh, data centers, and particularly this one, are mission critical infrastructure to support internet functions on your phone, your computer, and every and every electronic device that uses the internet um, so it it is what is needed in order for the what i'm going to describe as luxuries but they're actually necessities at this point to function so are these centers just um sort of uh i don't know equipment or are these office buildings where people will work it's both. Oh. So it, what we're proposing is going to be five buildings, which will appear like offices, but they will be outfitted with a series of computers uh, and also need to be serviced by people since due to the mission critical nature of data centers, uh, there are, it is a 24-hour operation with certain times being uh, having fewer employees. Let's just call it 50 uh, during not peak hours with a lot more for each building uh, during non-peak hours. Okay, thank you. Council President. Uh, you, who will these data centers serve? Anybody? Is it just gonna serve the local area? Is it for serving the local area or is it for serving? Uh, it's, it's for serving internet use, whoever is going to be going through the internet. Like we, I, it's, so anybody and anybody and everybody who's going to be using the internet, it, it, they could service them. So it's going to in, in our in the area, it'll uh, increase the 
Wi-Fi service. It'll make it a lot better because you have extra routers and um, equipment to send um, signal from one router to the other to enhance the signal in the area. Uh, you know, I, what generally enhances signal is is uh, like satellite towers, towers of that nature, and we're not necessarily proposing those types of towers. What what it does is it, it stores and it manages information that people can access off the internet. Mm -hmm. So you go to website A, um, that data has to be stored somewhere for website A. Uh, I'm not saying that website A will be at this data center, but they are at data centers in general. So this isn't like just something that Microsoft is behind uh, well, I do believe Microsoft is behind it, but I think there are several companies that are behind it as well. Okay. Like internet provider companies. All right. All but right, Microsoft is one of the companies. Thank you. Um, going to the second slide, it's just a vicinity map which shows just various, um, what we're describing as distribution properties or various industrial properties in the area just to provide context. The, the third slide is just the existing site. I'm pretty sure everybody's familiar. Um, to, the, to the right is 4, 495, and just below the site is 202. Uh, the next slide really shows the, the master plan that for, for the overall site, showing the overall density and other just various site data that might be interesting is, is all very relevant to the preliminary plan. So to, to clarify for anybody who hasn't had an opportunity to, to see the plans or to, to read uh, the, the staff report provided by your city manager, uh, we're proposing five buildings, roughly uh, 4 million square feet of data, data centers. Uh, the next slide just goes over just some general site information, like this, the, the current zoning, the prior zoning, the general site circulation, uh, just some acoustical information provided. I'm sorry. Um, that, it's this is slide five. Uh, the one, yeah, the, yeah. So what I'll do is I go through them. I'll just lift what I'm referring to. No, this is uh, four. Um, I see where Evar they're talking about opening that read up. I mean, it's closed now. Are you referring to? On four, slide four. Yes, ma'am. Uh, where it's Bicey Road and there's uh, Evar. Yes, ma'am. So you're saying you're, the plan is to open it up to four? Yeah, the, the plan, the overall plan is to have two access points, uh, one off Evar Street, the other one off Bright Seat Road. If you recall, for the old Landover Mall site, there are approximately five or six access points, either along Bright Seat or 202. Mm -hmm. um, now we're just proposing two, so that we're optimistic that that should help some of the traffic going forward. Uh, slide five just shows some site context related information. Slide six shows just what you will see from various angles, uh, 202, bright seat, 495. Slide seven shows just the various uh, sustainable measures that will be implemented on the site. Uh, and this is particularly uh, potent and interesting because as you guys, as you all may be aware, when the original site was developed, it was developed when there were no stormwater management regulations. So the, the mere fact that it is being developed consistent with the current regulations at the time, there should be a vast improvement in so some of the stormwater management that's not being managed on the site right now. And please, Feel free to, to pepper me with questions as I go through. Um, slide eight just shows some of the 
the building uh, features that generally appear on data centers. What well, later in this presentation, we show examples of what they do look like. So it's the actualization of these elements that you can see on this state on this page. Oh, there you go, Mr. Hatcher. Yes, ma'am. Uh, where the slide that you just showed us? That yeah, this Eight. one where it says change in building height. Are we saying that it's going to be taller than like change in, in what way? Um, I think a good example of that is going to be on slides nine, ten, eleven. Got it. So just different elements in the architecture which sort of break up what could otherwise be considered a monotonous building to add some character and some visual interest. So okay. what is the actual height of the buildings? I believe that information is provided on slide. Sorry, now I'm fumbling through since I was lifting I'm them up. I'm sorry, slide number. One moment. Slide number four, it's 102 feet with the penthouse included. Uh, slide number four is listed on the slide that there. Yes. Yeah, So slide number nine, 10, and 11 just show examples of those elements which were on the slide previously. And as you can see, these are very attractive buildings um, in any location. And so we, we do believe that it pro provides like a really good uh, front door to what is now the county seat or acting like the county seat Largo and what is will be you know, essentially a front door to the city, a front door to the city as well. Number 12 is just a view shed, what it will look like from 495, what you'll see once the trees are, are in and it's not winter. Uh, slide number 13, is a aerial diagram towards the bottom of the site you'll see 202 going uh, on the west side of the site that road going up is a bright seat and on the i guess it's the north east side is 495. and sorry so eberts is sort of at the top of the building yes parallel to 202. yes ma'am Room, but like riddled the back of the building yes okay. yes which is where one of the access points will be right and that street right now is kind of have like it's it's i don't know what the right term is like they're like single walkers for um barriers over there right that's that street yeah it's part of the road code whenever we whenever you um pull a permit and you have frontage along a street you have to provide you have to upgrade the road to county standards okay. so that that what what, what it is right now will not be what it will be upon development. Okay, and, and one other question, because this has come up in some previous conversations and I don't know to what extent you have any information on it, the possibility of extending Everts over 495 or 295? I have no direct knowledge, but I'm familiar with the, that it was included in, as one of the elements in the master plan to evaluate. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding that as part of the approval for Woodmore Town Center, they actually have a condition uh, that they have to provide it after a certain amount of development occurs. I, I'm not the, the land use attorney for Woodmore Town Center, so I'm not entirely sure of the details, mm -hmm. but I am quite sure it is in there. Okay. Does anyone on the council know if this development would meet the, that qualification for the amount of development that's necessary before? Um, actually, it's the only the development in Woodmore Town Center. Yep. Okay. So I think it's like they, when they pull the 500th residential permit and have a certain amount of square footage in office and retail, then that would trigger them to build the bridge. Okay. And then with that bridge, let's assume that will happen, right? Would the 
just normal pedestrian, um, sorry, normal driver that does not work in the data center, would they have access to go through eVarts and then go over? Or is there some sort of, you know, employee entrance so, that you need a badge or something? In I, I think I understand your question, so mm -hmm. I'm going to respond to the question I think you're asking, and if I don't, please correct me, okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, Evart Street is going to be a public street. We okay. are not, it is not going to be controlled access. It is technically a public street now, despite the condition that it is in. So when the developers of Woodmore Town Center fulfill whatever obligation they need to do in their approvals, again, I'm not their lawyer, I'm not entirely sure what's in their approvals, mm -hmm. um, and, and build that over, this development and will no way frustrate that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so for clarification purposes, I think this side of Evard on Bright Seat Road is like it's closed by barriers. Yes, ma'am. And once you open it up, is it going to connect to the Evard Street that's in on the side of like where Mr. White lives? That that's called Evard's. Well, right next to the Costco's, that's called Evard's also. So, because that's the, right now, that's a circle and it just has woods, and the other side of that is the beltway. So, how would it connect to? I'm wondering how it's going to connect to that. So, again, I, I don't represent Woodmore Town Center, the developers, so I, I'm not entirely sure how they are going to engineer it since it is their obligation. However, uh, my understanding is that there is right of way that was provided, uh, not where the Costco is. Um, but uh, almost directly diagonal to where you can see Woodmore Town Center on the other side. Okay. So my, my, understa uh, my understanding is that that is my understanding. Okay. I'll, well, I'll find out how it's going to connect because, yes, like I said, there's Evarts on this side, there's a big gulch or galley, and then on the other side next to Costco's, that is also, that street there is named Evarts. So I'll, I'll, I'll find out. How it's um, but again, what we are proposing will in no way frustrate that. Perfect. And we're going to open it up. Once this is constructed, we will fulfill all obligations that are required through county code. Okay, thank you. That was my question, so thank you. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on slide 14, which goes over the transportation, because uh, Mr. Guckert, our transportation engineer, has his own presentation, which does include this, so he can go into that uh, a lot more detail. But again, this is just one of those one of those three benefits that I mentioned earlier that this will produce uh, one-tenth of the traffic that would otherwise be done. The next slide really deals with the economic opportunities and fiscal opportunities associated with this. Uh, you know, besides the, the 400 jobs and the extraordinary amount of tax base that comes from developing a, uh, a data center, albeit that t those taxes ultimately go to the county. Um, it's just uh, having having uh, this type of facility, uh, a mission critical facility at the location, uh, just will will bring not only these benefits but also some of the benefits associated with some public parks that that planning is pushing us towards um, at the intersection of 202 and uh, and and bright seat and, and, and another one along bright seat. So there's just some real opportunities. I have a, a question. Um, have the residents at the apartments across bright seat road, have they been um, consulted? Do we have a sense of how they feel about this being directly across the street from them and in, in, in their view? I mean, it's a beautiful um, complex. They just, I think for what's there now, it might look a little bit out of place and I'm just wondering you know I'm, I'm not exactly sure of the height of these but I don't know now like if I if, if people are in their in their apartments now are they just kind of looking directly into somebody's office or uh, they're not looking at anybody's office they're looking at uh, what it looks like now mm -hmm. or or the uh, the car shop that's on the site no I mean like when it's done so I guess I just am curious to know have we even um, assessed the sentiment from the people that live over there around what how this how they'll be potentially impacted uh we we have been meeting with community stakeholders uh i i am not entirely sure if they live in those apartments or not i know that we provided notices to everybody them being adjoining property owners we have to provide notices directly to them um 
but I, I, I'm not entirely sure what the sentiment would be from them. But what I can tell you is to the first part of your question, um, what they're looking at, what they will be looking at is besides the, the two lane streets that are there, they're going to be looking at 40, uh, 40 feet because we have to set back 40 feet from the public streets and then a fence. And that 40 feet has to be vegetated. So we have to actually plant things. Mm -hmm. So despite the height, um, we believe that the distances and the vegetation, particularly as reflected in one of the earlier slides, which showed the view shed from that angle, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we believe that their view will be significantly improved from what they're seeing right now. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Madam President. Man. Yeah, so are you going to try to save the existing vegetation that's there, or are you going to replace all of that? Um, combination of both. Combination of both. Because I remember when it was Native Amal, they had some buildings that were probably as big as the ones that we're looking at right now. So, um, And the setback was so far that you know it didn't really interfere with the yeah. apartments across the street, Maple Ridge. Uh, and Ridge. I think Maple Ridge is even... The owners of that has even said that they're looking at it, maybe even closing them down, depending on what the development is or across the street. So I know they were in an MOU with um, the county about, you know, redeveloping those and also. So, and yeah. Council President Mayor, I was going to um, say almost the same thing as what Councilman Herring said, because but, cause it's been a while since I've heard that they were trying to do something with Maple Ridge. So. Good question, Council for Councilwoman Free. But I do think I'm pretty sure that they're looking at doing something with Maple Ridge. When I'm not sure because it's been a while. Okay. Madam President, um, so the existing businesses that surround that property are you all? I mean, are the developers thinking of buying them out to uh, further increase the aesthetics of the? development that they want to put in that'd be certainly great for me <laughs> um uh, at, at this point i think they're they're uniquely focused on trying to maximize what this could be for the county and truly really take advantage of the opportunity that data presents um especially considering the tax implications it had in certain parts of virginia this is just a really big opportunity for the state and the county so I mean, so how will we get them to blend in, or will that be the county's responsibility to kind of get them to blend in with the development that's coming along? I mean, that that car business is that I don't know if they're mechanics or what they do there, but um, yeah, they're not the prettiest thing to look at. Sometimes it they? can look kind of hideous, right? With the you know trucks coming in. We're optimistic that the vast majority of the frontage on two on Bright Seat Road will be improved because um, my client owns it and it's gonna be redeveloped. Um, we, we are, and this is in some documents where we're trying to get access off Bright Seat, we are working with that owner to try to share an access point so that we can further reduce the number of access points so there's not all these random access points. And as part of that, um, we will certainly have control of that access point, um, but, um, Sometimes the, the great thing about property rights is that when you own a piece of property, you can make it look as good or not as good as possible, and they've obviously decided to go in one way or the other. Thank you. Madam President, yeah. and, I, and I feel that's, a, that's something that we as a city also need to look at because that probably has been an issue for a number of years. Um, it isn't kept up very well. And I know before when he was talking about selling it, it I mean, he was just, out of, it was just, nobody was going to buy it for the price he wanted for it. So I guess he's not, he really has no vested interest in it. I mean, he's just going to repair cars and park cars. He use it as um, risking stadium parking at times, you know? So, I mean, in order to be a good neighbor, I think that's something that, you know, the county really needs to look at. Because again, if you're going to have a data center here and have that on the front of it, it's not gonna, I mean, I think we as a community, as a city really needs to push for, you know, them to do something to bring that really up to code. Cause I'm telling you, I, I guarantee you there's probably all kind of code violations just with the cars sitting over there in and of themselves. So, all right, thank you. And I, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily want to belabor the point, but it's, 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 it's really good points. Just looking at the next few slides particularly tax revenue um, 
and it's the tax revenue without any real impact on public facilities as compared to what would be there like that I, I one tenth of the traffic that would that was anticipated for that site that's pro that blows my mind and I do this every day I do this every day for the last 14 years um, slide 18 is a, a rendered landscape plan about uh, from an aerial perspective what the site will look like and so I think to, to go back to some of your questions about what what some of those apartments across the street will see um, before they before they see a data center they're going to see a, a, a lot of other things which is going to be significantly better than what they're looking at right now in my opinion And the, the last substantive slide just sort of summarizes what we believe uh, the most impactful benefits are. But I, I hit those in the beginning, and since I think they're so profound, I'm going to hit them again. One, one tenth of the traffic that would otherwise be produced in the MXT or TAC zones, uh, 1.8 to 1.9 million dollars of pedestrian and bicycle improvements. Um, and uh, just the overall aesthetic, if you take, again, take one last look at slide 20, the next slide, that's the front door to the county and to the city. That's the front door. Uh, I know that Wes Guckard is on to go over transportation. I skipped the slide in transportation in this because I know Wes would want to go through it himself. You want me to pull the, uh, share my screen? Can you see my screen? Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. We can see the screen, Wes. Okay, very good. So let me take one, you one, one moment. Mr. Gray, could you turn up the volume, please? So we can all hear him. Testing. Can you hear me? Can you hear? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to take you through uh, a number of slides and uh, let me start by saying that we were the traffic and transportation planner for, uh, for the town center across the street and where when, when the question was asked about Evar Street, the town center has an obligation that if they, when they build a million square feet of office space, they have to construct the bridge uh, and extend Evart Street from uh, the town center across the beltway uh, to Evart Street that uh, abuts the, the data center. So there, there's an obligation by, by the town center to do that, Woodmore Town Center to do that, uh, but not until uh, there's a million square feet of office space uh, is constructed. The, the first slide uh, is one that is extremely important. And, and Chris indicated uh, that in all the years he's been doing this, um, it's rare that you find a development uh, that's going to generate less traffic. And in this particular case, what it, the current zone is versus what is being proposed, uh, what is being proposed as a data center will generate about 10% the amount of traffic that it could generate. So from a traffic comparison point of view, there is no comparison. This is a great thing for everyone concerned. 
Now, pedestrian improvement opportunities. I want to stop right here uh, because I think it's very important for the town to understand that what we have with the, the county regulations, the Bicycle Pedestrian uh, Improvement Study, BPIS, uh, is one that I think that the town of Glen Arden can take um, and work with planning staff and most importantly with the planning board because this data center as it relates to uh, the amount of money uh, that, that they have to spend is two to four times in pedestrian and safety improvement than the other permitted uses. And the reason for that is other permitted uses as it relates to residential uh, does not have the requirement according to the county council uh, to spend as much money. And this is a map that will de that details the areas where improvements may be made. Um, now, as you can see by, by your town's map, there's going to be an opportunity uh, to spend almost $2 million in pedestrian safety and park improvements if the 4 million square feet of the data center is built. The county, the county planning board will make the final determination of where this money is spent, which means to me that the town of Glen Arden has an opportunity to work with the planning staff, to work with the planning board, to work with the chairman of the planning board, uh, even up to the day of the hearing on March 14th, uh, to give the planning board your set, the town set of improvements that, that should be done. This list of, list of improvements is in a cost order with the highest cost first, uh, going down to the lowest cost. This is not a uh, a complete list. There could be other things, and they doesn't have to go in this order. It simply is a wish list that we were asked to put together by the the, uh, uh, the county staffs, and they made recommendations. We made recommendations, which means that the town of Glen Arden is going to have an opportunity to do the same thing. They're going to be able to take and look at that this this list of improvements and be able to go back and say to the uh, to the planning board, you know what, we would like to see improvement one C first, or we would like to see improvement one F first, or second, or third, or whatever it is. But because there is uh, one point nine million dollars in improvements, it really is like Christmas uh, as it relates to improving pedestrian safety and, and park improvements uh, when this data center is approved and ultimately built. So um, improvements that are possible in the town of Glen Arden um, within the, the, the town's uh, boundaries is upgrading traffic signals, providing ADA and ped safety improvements, providing upgrades to the park, even though it's not in the town, uh, providing new or upgraded sidewalks on both sides of Evarts, from uh, both sides of Bright Seat, from Evarts all the way up to Glen Arden Parkway. All in all, uh, there's also improvements that, that uh, we expect we're going to be making at 202 and Bright Seat Road. We're waiting for comments from the state and the county uh, on our recommendations that are shown here. Uh, adding additional lanes, restriping, rebuilding the traffic signal. Those are the things that um, we think we're going to be uh, required to do. So, uh, questions. Thank you so much, Council President. 
<laughs> Council Farid. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I just have a question on the timing of when the city would be able to weigh in on the priority of the improvements. I, I think the city could weigh in at any time. Um, if it were me, if I were sitting in your seat, I would be uh, finding what your list of improvements are, mm -hmm. getting them sent down to the planning board and to the uh, uh, planning staff right now. You're not going to miss an opportunity because the, the, the final decision will not be made until the planning board hits the gavel uh, to hopefully approve this project. But there, there's nothing wrong with doing it now. If you if the if the city can decide what improvements they want to see first on the top of their list, um, that they ought to be able to do that now. To and just to 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 help uh, to add more information. My understanding uh, from from reading the staff report from your city manager is that it's anticipated that you guys will likely write a letter, hopefully in support but a letter, uh, and in that letter, you can articulate what's common for most municipalities in the entitlement processes for them to articulate their desires in that letter. So that might be an opportunity to do that. Thank you. And, and, and the, the improvements that I laid out are a wish list uh, that, allows, that allows a city to make a determination as to what they would like to see first. And I, my, my opinion doing this for decades is that the planning board and the planning chairman would welcome hearing from, uh, from, the, from the city council the things that they would like to see. And what happens is the, the developer, uh, when he pulls the building permit, he has to start uh, creating a fund for these things design them, and then build them. And that, as, as you guys are going through the list, and I know that, that you guys have the traffic report and the BPIS analysis, um, uh, it is roughly $1.9 million, uh, but there are rules and regulations associated with where and how it can be used. That's how we developed uh, our portion of the list. And so to the extent that, um, you know, we focused on things that were compliant with the regulations to the extent that you have thoughts that might also be compliant with the regulations. That's fine with us. But there are regulations about how and where that can be done. Hey, Mr. President. Councilman Harris. Yes, can I ask a question? I'm just curious about the improvement 1B where it says construct an eight foot shed use, use path along the north side of Merlin 202 from Bright Sea Road to St. Joseph's Drive. So that crosses over the beltway. Will they be expanding a the bridge there, or how are, yeah. they, are they going to reduce a lane? No, um, the, the that particular improvement came from the Department of Public Works, um, and they're the ones that want to see that happen. And it would not be adding a lane to uh, to two hundred two. It would be. Uh, trying to figure out a way to, to make that work within either the existing right of way, the existing mm -hmm. grid, existing paving. Uh, that has not yet been uh, designed improvement one day. None of these improvements have really been designed just yet. Um, they are concepts that would that would be required to be designed at, at the time that the building permits are pulled. Okay, because I mean, I just that just concerns me because again, we have so much traffic going up and down 202. If they're going to use the existing roadway and they're going to reduce a lane or shrink it down, or I think I can see a bottleneck there. Um, well, and, and you see, that's that's the perfect opportunity yeah. uh, for the city to to say one B is not something that we believe is in our best interest. Nothing wrong with saying that. Right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. What else? Any other questions? Uh, City Manager Habita. 
one question about the intersection at uh, Bright Seat and 202. Uh, in reading the traffic study, it says uh, that on either the county model or the state highway model, that intersection with the improvements will fail. It'll be at an F level. Um, am I reading that wrong, or is there some improvements that I have not seen yet that will address that intersection? Well, I, I think you may be reading it wrong because what we have to do is to uh, mitigate our impact. Um, it's not going to be uh, Nirvana, Christmas, uh, whatever, but we will have to mitigate our impact. And, uh, and we're gonna, we, we plan to do that. Let me share my screen uh, one more time. All right, can you see the screen or not? Yes. Uh, we can see the screen, Wes. Okay, so there, there's there's uh, two improvements at 202 and Bright Street. Construct a third northbound to westbound triple left uh, and restripe southbound uh, to provide a through lane and double left uh, along Bright Street Road at 202 and to rebuild the traffic signal. Uh, those are improvements that we're waiting to hear back from State Highway if they uh, want to allow that to happen. Uh, and But we would be uh, mitigating our impact. Uh, again, it's not going to make it level of service A, B, or C, uh, but we would take care of the, the amount of traffic that we would be generating uh, by the data center. Any other questions? Well, at this point, I think so. I think it makes sense for them to be able to ask questions. Okay. If, ma'am, you have a question. If you could um, actually come to the podium, state your name. All right, hello, my name is Jaleesa Arnold and I'm a city of Glen Arden resident. Um, so my only question about the data centers, um, I just going back to the point of how the community people feel um, more education for the community residents on these centers and the usage of them. Um, some data centers are linked to massive energy consumers. Also, do these, um, do these centers require diesel exhaust output and do they consume water for power usage without really having a way to off put the water? Also, some have been linked to increase in noise. So will it disturb the local community residents? Those are my only questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, to answer the the noise, the acoustical related question first, because I can go through the rest of them. I believe we have uh, somebody on Carlos. He's one of the design team. He should be able to address that. Hi, hey, good afternoon. My name is Carlos Coding um, with Corrigan, a data center architect over here in, in Dallas. Um, so absolutely can, can address uh, some of the, the noise concerns. Uh, typically, based on security setbacks as well as um, zoning ordinances, uh, we, we tend to find a lot of our buildings actually have are fairly set back into the site. And there's a couple of different measures that are generally taking um, when, it, when it comes to, to noise mitigation in terms of sound acoustics, 
um, screen walls that are sound absorbing. Um, and then also there's hospital grade silencers on, <clears throat> on generators that, that are typically incorporated. Um, as well as any generators that are typically used for emergency purposes or, or, or for that for emergency if there's power outages in the area, um, mainly for the mission critical nature that, that we find ourselves with, with data centers in general, as well as those generators are not incorporated during the daytime or, or really for any usage other than, than uh, emergency use. That helps uh, facilitate some of the, uh, the questions. Uh, with, I'm sorry, again. Uh, with respect to the water usage, uh, they typically have mechanical systems which are closed loop. And so what will happen is, uh, meaning that the, the water cooling would be provided by the chillers and recirculate the water. So after the initial water demand, there's not that big of a demand after the initial one. Um, and uh, considering the tax revenue that's sort of generated from data centers, what we've experienced and, and what's been experienced by the jurisdictions is that the utilities try to go out of their way to try to make sure that they can upgrade their systems to to handle it so we would we would expect something similar here but obviously we have to coordinate with the utilities at a later date council president councilman um, for thank you um Um, we may want to consider putting together some materials, some informational um, materials for the community to, to share with them ahead of um, any construction for sure so that people can, you know, make sure they are comfortable in understanding what is happening there and at least feel that they had the opportunity to um, kind of digest what's being proposed there and, and understanding kind of what's in there coming in their neighborhood. So I don't know if that would be something that the city would do in collaboration. Obviously, we don't have, we're not the source of the data. Right. You would, um, we would need that information from you. But um, I know you said before that there were notices. Are those just the kind of standard typical notices? The standard that, typical yeah. notices that go out uh, through the entitlement process. I mean, I, let me coordinate with my client and, and, and get back with your city manager. I think we can help you out. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Jones. So I, I want to go back to the the uh, question the uh, Miss Arnold, I think she said her name was, had about the water issue. So you all have they haven't coordinated with WSSC yet to find out if they're going to be able to accommodate this uh, development. It's not typical to coordinate with any of the utilities at this point in the in the development process. But so but, but there was obviously a, a regional mall there for quite a while, which had utility constraints that were serviced. Mm, that was many years ago. I'm sure that stuff is corroded by now, um, <laughs> but we'll see. So it's not till after the project has been accepted by Maryland National Park and Planning that, uh, or the planning board, that you all coordinate with the utilities. Uh, as far as I, I think probably be BG, it may be PG&E or PEPCO and WSSC and... It would be, yeah, it would be PEPCO here in WSSC. Um, well, I have BG&E, so I'm not sure I mean, which, for this site, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, how, where the boundary is. Right. Um, I, th I believe... Through the preliminary plan process, uh, and this is this is this is a lot of detail, but I'm going to try to answer your question directly. Through the preliminary plan process, what you have to do is provide uh, public utility easements along all this public road frontages. Mm -hmm. It's usually 10 feet, and all the utilities, whether it's water, power, well, power, cable, and various other dry utilities, fit into those that 10 foot PUE. Uh, we are for the most part we're providing that on all on all sides of us. Uh, so that, that goes to the physical infrastructure of, of the utilities accessing the property. Uh, I, th I believe your question is on the consumption of the water and on the electricity that, that would happen. Um, those things typically occur uh, later in the entitlement process because this is more of a planning process as opposed to the permitting and um, the allocation. So 
Uh, we're not we're not necessarily there in the process yet, uh, but we will be there soon, hopefully. Oh, but due to due to the uh, data, the data center is requiring a lot of. They say it requires a lot of water for it to uh, function. I, I would think that would be something that would be addressed first. You know, to make sure that they had we have the facility, the infrastructure to. Uh, be able to sustain that uh, development? Uh, I, I definitely understand. And uh, we, we don't necessarily see there being an issue with the capacity, uh, the water capacity in this area. Uh, but candidly, if there is, we can't pull a permit. We can't move forward. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. President, may I? Yes, Councilor yes. Harry. Um, I do know a number of years ago they ran a major water main down 202 to deliver more water down there. So I don't think you're going to have an issue with the water uh, per se. But I was looking at uh, the planning board requiring an underground storage system to filter the water. Um, is that still in play? I'm looking at the uh, comments that were made by the um, planning board. No, th thank you very much for your question. Uh, so I think you've met Wes, who's our transportation engineer and Carlos, who is our architect for data centers. Also with us here is Dubray, who's a site civil engineer. Uh, we brought our design team here just in case you had any questions. Um, and what I'm hearing from Nick when he yes. nodding his head up and down is yes, okay. uh, that is still gonna be something we have to do. Okay. Um, also, so, I mean, you're looking at the picture, so the facade of the building is gonna be mostly what, glass and brick, brick and stone? Uh, yeah, various types of uh, masonry and glass. Okay, all right. And they're gonna uh, meet all the environmental requirements that they, you know, that's required now. Yes, absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Um, that's it for me. Council McGill. I, um, Thank you, Council President. Wanted to make sure, Ms. Arnold, did you feel like all of your questions were answered? Um, I think once the package is put together for the community, we're really going into depth, explaining the project, the purpose, I think it'll be a little bit more clear. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. And for me, what I wanted to just um, clearly say that I'm grateful that this is being recorded. Um, for future pe future developers who want to come into our city, um, I would hope that they follow what you all are doing right now, which is coming to us to hear from our residents and ourselves and trying to get our input. So I really value the process and order that has been done by you all coming here to make sure that we are involved. Mr. President, one other thing. Um, yeah, would you be open to coming to uh, another public forum um, where we can get this more citizens out, not just a regular public hearing, because this is just like a small meeting. You see there's only a number of citizens out. But normally if we do a public forum, then we'll reach out to all the citizens through, by mail to have them come out, just to be aware of what's coming up um, so that they can be more um, involved and more um, made aware of what's coming down the uh, pike on that site because a lot of them are asking about it and I guarantee you a lot of them may have questions but they're not here tonight so um, I mean it'd be great if you could actually do that um, if we could schedule another meeting sometime um, in the near future maybe I mean I mean I mean like I said you can just work it out with your team and see if that's available I mean if that's possible and we can make it happen okay. absolutely thank you and I just, I just want, I do just want to say this. I do want to say one other thing. You know, I think that this is to be a perfect um, addition to Prince George's County. A lot of, um, we lack tech in this county. And this, this development, I think, will start attracting tech to Prince George's County. And I think that's what we need. Um, it's, it's, it's an economic engine that will desperately grow, um, you know, the tech industry in the county, but also assist you know, with, uh, with Wilmore Town Center, which is one of the most popular shopping destinations now in the county. So it would be a benefit and a boon. Uh, again, Learners Corporation is a great corporation. They've shown what they've done throughout the region. You know, Land of the Mall was a great success, you know. Um, so I just think we need to look at it carefully and just really, 
you know, look at the benefits that this project would bring to the, the entire community. All right, thank you. Thank you. Are, are there any other questions? Thank you guys very much for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. This, this is what you call equitable development. Oh, okay. All right. You can, or you can say. Uh, one, one second. There was one question. Do you have any questions for us? I really hope you guys support us. That wasn't a question. I was a statement. That was amazing. Please. That's all right. There you go. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Sentences moving on to the next item on the agenda um, is citizens' comments on proposed legislation. Um, citizens, if online or if you are in the building, um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. I'll call on you virtually. If you're inside, raise your hand and I'll call on you here. If you could come up to the podium, state your name, uh, and you will have five minutes to speak on uh, proposed legislation. With that, the floor is open for citizens' comments. I saw Ms. Wilson's hand. Good evening. Um, I am former Councilwoman Celestine Wilson. And I am, um, I have questions and comments concerning, oh, I don't even know the number on here, but dealing with the, um, the, f um, the schedule of rule, the rules, regulations, and fee schedules for the goal room and for the community center at Woodmore Town Center. When I listened to the work session, there were several questions um, that were, um, and several comments were made uh, as far as suggestions to uh, things that, how do you say it? you everybody didn't agree on and there was things were open-ended so um people were supposed to check to see if this was the case or if that was the case and so um i think some of those things that had to um be looked into uh dealt with going to the health department going to the um county and so until those things are resolved, uh, I would ask that the council put this on the back burner, that you table this until uh, the citizens know exactly what the case is. Some things might not be true in here. So I would like to see it tabled uh, until it is a complete package, a complete what it is that you wanna present to the, to the citizens. Um, I think that it's, 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 not, it's just not complete right now. My other uh, comment has to do with the, um, a resolution for establishing the select committee for the IMCCETF. And I read this resolution and I don't see where it defines what that is, the IMCCETF. What is it that um, that stands for? What is it about? What does it mean? Um, I don't understand the purpose for the task force. Um, 
And I just think that this, it kind of leaves uh, room for discrimination based upon some of the thing, uh, discriminating practices dependent upon, um, dependent upon what's already in here. So there's no definition as to what this is, why it is, what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Fareed. Thank you, Council President. Um, so I agree with you, former Councilwoman Wilson. I think we can just spell out what that is. Um, that's the intermunicipal county um, task force. Um, and that was a piece of legislation that we passed um, in the last regular meeting. And the purpose of that task force um, if I could try to summarize it, is to really bring forward, um, bring together the different stakeholders in the community, those within the city of Glen Arden, as well as those within a two mile radius of the city to talk about developments and any plans that are happening from a county level or a state level that are impacting us. We really wanted to bring um, this task force forward so that our voices can be combined um, and we can really kind of come approach the county, approach, you know, whomever developers with a collective voice about what we would like to see in our community or even do things like, um, you know, uh, provide feedback on what we don't want to see. And so that is the purpose of the task force. And in that other legislation that established the task force, um, part of that was that there would be a selection committee established that would go about um, inviting specific people. But as part of the selection process, it's also to be advertised publicly so that people who are interested in participating in this task force have the opportunity to apply to be a part of that. So we're trying to, with this particular committee, is take that work on of you know, casting our net wide to make sure that we have a good representation of voices on this task force. And again, there is um, the requirement per the resolution that's already been passed that there will be a public um, notification. And I, I, I'm not sure if the council clerk has looked into that already, but that's already, you know, an action to take. So this selection committee will just be sort of reviewing those applications and making recommendations for who should be on the task force. Thank you, Councilman Fareed. Mr. Powell. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Anthony Powell, and I live in Ward 1. And I would like to make a comment by R41-2024. I noticed on the steering committee that there's, there's only three citizens who are not related to the government to serve on this committee. And I was wondering maybe you could open it up for more citizens who want to join the committee. I mean, we have at least 6,400 people in Glen Arden, maybe over 7,000. There might be people who really want to join this committee who know something about running uh, a farmer's market or any other business who may want to join. So why are we limited to only like three people who are not related to the government? So per the resolution, the, um, the steering committee for the farmer's market will consist of 10 members, three of them from the council, three from um, ward representatives, and then the rest is uh, city staff. I think for purposes of just being able to operate effectively, we can't have a steering committee that consists of lots of members. Um, and so three was the amount that we felt was reasonable with each, with a person representing each ward. Um, we did solicit for a, an extended period of time um, for people to volunteer. And these are the three people who have volunteered um, from the wards. I, frankly, we didn't have anybody else other than these three people. So um, it's the, the resolution for the farmer's market was passed a long time ago, about a year ago. And at all of our public events, um, even in the communications that in the newsletters that we've sent out, we've solicited for people to participate, not just in the farmer's market, 
um, committee, but all of the committees that we are hoping to have citizens engaged in. So I think there are a lot of opportunities. Um, you know, feel free to sign up for one. These terms, um, I think, are one year or two years. Um, so it, it will not be that these are the only people who will ever be involved. And we certainly welcome um, participation in, you know, when the farmer's market happens and soliciting feedback. We know that you, Mr. Powell, um, are not shy with your feedback. So we welcome it all. Thank you. But the money to run this farmer's market come from the property taxes. Am I right or wrong about that? Uh, we, there's an operating yeah. budget. I, I, I don't, I think. Mostly from the property taxes. So that to me, the citizens <clears throat> should have more of an opportunity to serve on this committee. So what would you suggest, Mr. Powell? At least 15 people. That would, be un, uh, that would be unwieldy, I think, in terms of trying to um, plan and execute the operation. So what these this steering committee is doing is making sure that we have the appropriate permits in place, making sure that there's um, a marketing campaign, making sure that the information is getting out there. So so these particular, these the role of the citizens steering committee members is really to touch the community, touch their neighbors and make sure that their neighbors are understanding what, um, what needs to be done. These people were not identified one because they volunteered they you know there were there were not a plethora of people for us to choose from but part of their participation is not having any they don't have to have any background in farmers markets that's what we are going to have a consultant help us do that is an expert in in doing that so this is just to make sure that their citizen voices um, as we you know initiate our first farmers market like I said, we have at least 6,000 people in Glenard, maybe over 7,000. Maybe we can find somebody who know about how to run this kind of stuff. And the council president, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, so I'm one, just asking. One, one I'm second. just asking. I'm not, I'm I, not. I understand. But you have two minutes, 30 seconds left. So I want you to ask all your questions, and then we can address your concerns, so I don't want to take up your time. So if you have anything else. Now that's, that's basically it. Maybe we had to get out of the mode that only elected officials should serve on these committees and stuff. Okay. People associated with the government. There's it's probably people out here in Glenarch who know how to do this. We had to go out and find them. Okay. Okay, that's all I got to say. Council, Thank you, sir. Wait, I, may I respond to Mr. Yes, Powell? Yes, Um Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Mr. Powell. I, I just want to overstate some of the things that you said and, and the point that I believe Councilwoman Farid was saying as well, which is you are correct that there are probably six, well, over 6,000 citizens in the city, but you also are missing one aspect of what you're saying, which is yes, the residents should have and they are part of the steering committee, but they were given ample opportunities to volunteer. So out of the 6,000 plus, three came to us. It's not that we went, you know, three are the ones that volunteered. So I think the better question or maybe the situation at hand is how do we get the additional 6,000 plus to want to volunteer? That's the issue. Oh, I'll also add that with 6,000 plus citizens, there are only seven council members um, in the city. And I, I, I think that um, the size of the committee matters too much, you know, wouldn't operate officially too little, wouldn't have enough input. So, but I, I, I agree with your basis of having community involvement. And that's something that, you know, especially want to do even for this upcoming election, make sure that more and more people are involved, even past the election. That's one of the things that I want to see in the city that more people get involved uh, and represent things that they're interested in. So I appreciate your comment. Mr. President, may I just and, add to that right quick? And, and the reason why that, 
The three members that sponsored the legislation did a lot of research on farmers markets. So they know what they want. They know how to steer the group the way they needed to go. And so, th I mean, there's no need in having a, pulling the committee together and having nobody have any direction. There's no need for us putting a committee together and putting seven citizens on there that really doesn't know what's, what's going. We've done that before with a number of committees and they did not function efficiently. Now, again, if the council members decide they want to create a committee, which the charter allows us to do, you know, and they want to steer it and they want it to go in a certain direction that's going to be more efficient and going to give the citizens what we are trying to accomplish, I, I don't see anything wrong with it. Again, I mean, you can have a committee that just languished, and we've had a number of committees that have languished, as we see with the Ethics Committee, which has not moved anywhere and that we need to get, you know, moving. So again, I, I, again, I mean, if they if they're going to do the legwork, council members, I mean, we we are part time, but they took a lot of time to research farmers markets. They took a lot of time to see what is needed, and so when you get the volunteers on on board, they're ready to go. That's what and that's what it's all about to uh, to provide the, the services to the citizens. That's what the committees are for. So I just wanted to put that out there. That's why we do what we do. Mr. Powell, you going to volunteer? Uh, you go ahead. Well, first off, I would just like to say I didn't I I didn't know too much about the meeting. I was personally invited to come. I'm because, sorry, if you could state your name again. I'm for sorry, Jaleesa Arnold, City of Glen Arden resident, and I didn't know too much about the meeting. I was personally invited to come um, on behalf of uh, the Gold Room uh renovation project i guess um so that is why i'm here um tonight um but it the other topics that are coming up now that i'm here and reading all of this um definitely spark my interest as well as the farmer's market uh, me being a chef and owner of a catering company and farmer <laughs> i didn't know anything about this but i am here now and i would like to get more involved and my only question is how are you guys reaching because um, i'm sure a certain percentage of the city of glenard and residents are millennials or in that age range like how are you reaching like the younger generation to help them get involved and know about these things because me per i can only speak for myself um i would like to be involved but just i guess knowing about it or getting information um to volunteer more for these opportunities um is my question of like how you guys do that yes mm -hmm. Uh, so we have uh, several points of communication. We use our website. Uh, we uh, have an email listserv that we send out. We also uh, do mailings uh, for social media, um, newsletter. Um, and one of the greatest ways mm -hmm. being involved is, um, is coming to the, the regular meetings to know what's happening. Um, e even if you don't come in person, I think, yeah, so the work session is virtual. Okay. Uh, and of course this is in person and next week our regular session is okay. in person too. Um, so we welcome you to um, come on and welcome any ideas you have uh, for us of how we can better reach um, people we may be missing. Yeah, I'm just curious to know your social media engagement um, because a lot of um, what I do with my business is social media based. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to look at the engagement and the numbers and the audience that is targeting mm -hmm. um, to look at the city of Glenard and younger uh, population or generation because that's how you can reach them, reach us nowadays. It's, I'm, unfortunately, I know everybody isn't into social media, but if we leverage it correctly, um, I think we can get a bigger turnout in terms of volunteers because had I seen that I would have been out sooner um, and I'm willing to get involved. Um, I just didn't really know um, about it. And today I came because I was personally invited to speak on behalf of um, the renovations that are desperately needed um, for the gold room. It's, I'm sorry, I don't want to take up more of your time. Is that? No, that's it. That's all I have. 
Okay. And what? Oh yeah, the gold room. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, I don't know how these meetings work, <laughs> but um, for the gold room in particular, um, I work in a lot of event centers throughout Prince George's County. So I've seen what they're able to offer in terms of being just a caterer coming in and looking at the venue, what it offers, technology updates, um, the from the floors being updated, the decor, the lighting. Um, the gold room is very dim and dark. Um, I've done events there um, and it's just not very like warm and inviting and I don't think it has a lot of updates with like the tech updates. So I think with certain, I'm, I'm just here to say like I'm for renovations, um, making us as a city of Lenarna able to compete with other event centers and um, places throughout Prince George's County. And right now, when you think of the gold room, it's just, from what I hear in the community, it's just like the place where people, the, I don't want to offend anyone, but like the more of the, I don't know how to say this. Yeah, old school <laughs> um, events are held or funerals. And I don't think that's what we should be attracting. Um, we should be attracting all types of events, but I don't think the facility is updated enough to even engage that type of, um, you know, publicity because it's, it's just very old and outdated. So I'm just here to place my bid that I'm for renovations for the gold room. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilman Fareed. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Arnold. I would just um, appreciate if you could leave your information. We have an addition. So there's kind of a combination of, of legislation that's going together. Um, we have community gardens and we also have the farmer's market. And the idea really was to, to help the community understand more about healthy ways of eating, nutrition, bringing in educational classes um, with a chef who could perhaps teach people how to cook the food that they're growing in their backyard. So, you know, yes, yes. And so that was the idea of kind of having all of this as, as part of um, the farmer's market. One of the things that we um, suggested was that if you have, if you're growing in the community garden that you get um, preference to be able to sell then at the farmer's market. So we also wanted to create an avenue for people to, you know, have another stream of income um, for themselves. So we would certainly appreciate your expertise in this area. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, don't forget. Okay. Follow the city of Glen Arden too. <laughs> at City Glenarden. Tweet us, X us, whatever it is. Oh. Okay. Are there any other citizens' comments online? Okay. Sure. For the for the rules of okay, and and for all those online who cannot hear Miss Wilson, she just reiterated or want to clarify that uh, position on the gold room rules and community center rules that she was not in favor of it and that she thinks the council needs to go back and look at it again. Did I capture that correctly? Okay. With that being said, do we still need to go? Okay, all right. With that being said, uh, the council is expected to go into closed session to discuss legal matters. Um, the council reserves the right to go into closed session anytime during a public meeting. Uh, and with that being said, is there a motion 
to close the open meeting. So move. There's second. Second. Second by Councilman Hairston. Any discussion? Uh, I'll do the voice vote. Councilwoman Fareed? Yes. Councilwoman Guillaume? Yes. <clears throat> Councilman Hairston? Yes. Councilman Herring? Yes. Councilwoman Jones? Yes. Council Vice President Ferguson? Yes. And Council President? Yes. The vote is in, all in favor. With that, the open portion of our meeting is, is closed. Uh, and we welcome citizens back next Monday Recording at 7. Stopped. I'm sorry, next Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. for our regular session. Oh, also on the 17th at 11 a.m. is the Black History Program in the Gold Room. So we welcome you to come out there.